This podcast is brought to you by Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks. If you would like to support it, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris. Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, so a little housekeeping before I introduce today's guest. First, regarding the ongoing Apple FBI controversy, it's now been, I think this is the third podcast where I have had a running commentary on this, but information continues to come in and my views on the topic uh, continue to shift. So uh, I heard from one engineer at Google who pushed back against my initial thoughts in a way that I thought was fairly persuasive. In particular, he argues that the analogies I drew to DNA encryption and uh, building an impregnable room in one's house are not valid. If you recall, I said that people who say they don't want the government to ever have access to a smartphone, no matter what the reason, are claiming a right to privacy that doesn't exist in the real world and that no sane person could ever want. And I drew two analogies here. I said it was rather like imagining that you should be able to encrypt your DNA so that no one could ever analyze it. Or you should be able to build an impregnable room in your house that could never be searched without your consent. And um, my correspondent, who I will leave nameless, fairly demolishes those analogies. And I'll read you the relevant parts of his email. Because judging from my inbox, many of you are very interested in this topic, and uh, many are dissatisfied with the noises I've made thus far. So a Google engineer writes, quote, The digital world is one unified thing. People use the same platforms for privacy-sensitive and security-sensitive tasks. The same browser people use to watch their porn, they also use to manage their bank accounts. The same device that stores your family photos stores your tax records, and so on. Maybe it shouldn't be this way, but that's how it is. And this makes some anti-crypto arguments non-starters. For example, you're hypothetical about anonymizing DNA. Of course it would be a bad thing to give people that kind of privacy today. But that's because keeping your DNA untraceable has no other significant uses beyond evading criminal prosecution. Now, if you remember the dystopian sci-fi movie Gattaca, that shows why we may someday have a need for DNA privacy and why this would clearly trump the needs of crime investigation. You start from a position of sanity, but your intuition fails to consider circumstances of digital security which are very different from traditional scenarios of privacy slash security. You make another metaphor of a police-proof safe room someone might want to build in their house. And I agree with you, that's not something that I believe to be my right. Not as a citizen in a society that grants the state the role of upholding security, if necessary, with use of force. What you fail to see is that digital security has a game-changer attribute. Scalability. We geeks love that word, but in this case it's a bad thing. I don't have a big safe, but I lock my front door. It's a good balance between my privacy slash security and the needs of the state, because in the worst case of having no key and no collaboration from me, the police can force my door or my window or even bulldoze an entire wall. But this imperfect security is not a big problem for the regular protection I need from common burglars or neighbors or paparazzi if I'm a celebrity, etc. But the digital world is like having a house at zero distance from every burglar in existence, including the planet's top lockpickers. They have zero cost and near zero risk attempting to break into my door. The, quote, police are virtually non-existent. And even if identified, the bad guys are probably out of reach of prosecution. Even the amateurs have tools that allow them to probe millions of doors per second. And the pros have access to the same heavy tools that the police would use to force my door. And perhaps I live in a huge condo with a single door, so hacking that one lock will expose millions to ransacking. That's the nature of every digital device connected to the Internet. Attacking them is a highly scalable task. You're not protected by your location. There's no affluent neighborhood with low crime and good police where the wealthy can live and feel safe. Nope, the Internet is a dystopian world when it comes to security. It's a Mad Max scenario where you're only safe if your front door and your entire house and your personal car is blinded like Fort Knox's safes and armed with flamethrowers. End quote. So I thought that was quite good, and that definitely pushes my intuitions around. Um, 
Perhaps even more compelling than this was to see Michael Hayden, the former head of the NSA and the CIA, in fact, the only person to ever run both organizations, and a man who at one point thought that Edward Snowden should be tried for treason. I'm not sure if he still believes that. To see him come out with some qualifications on Apple's side in this dispute. And one of his reasons was that he considers cybersecurity to be the most important area of our vulnerability, and the vulnerability of open societies generally, against terrorists and enemy states. And uh, he thinks that end-to-end -end encryption would, on balance, keep us all much safer than we currently are, even with the liability that you wouldn't be able to get into the smartphone of a terrorist, uh, as we can't in the present case. And um, if true, I think that probably just settles the matter for me, because after all, my concern is about the safety of open societies. But in any case, I'm trying to get Hayden on the podcast. I may actually try to get Snowden on the podcast. And uh, I will let you know if either of those efforts bear fruit. Another housekeeping item. The ways to support this podcast have multiplied and been consolidated on my website. Uh, so links to everything can now be found at samharris.org forward slash donate. Uh, as you know, I've created a Patreon page, which allows you to support the podcast on a per episode basis. And many hundreds of you are now doing that. Now, lest you fall prey to the diffusion of responsibility here, I can say that only about one-third of one percent of the people, about one in 300, uh, who regularly listen to this podcast are now supporting it. Now, needless to say, I am very grateful to those of you who are. But one-third of one percent support can't be the future of digital media. And diffusion of responsibility is a totally understandable phenomenon. I experience it myself. In fact, I recently gave money to PBS for the first time I can remember, realizing that I had been happily watching Downton Abbey for years without paying a dime. Now, see, it's easy not to perceive the need here, because you know, the PBS is funded by rich donors and large foundations. In any case, there's now a way that you can support this podcast without spending any extra money at all. On my donation page, you'll see that there's a link to my Amazon affiliates account. Now, if you shop at Amazon through that link, a small percentage of what you spend will go to support this podcast without it costing you anything extra. And if you take a moment to bookmark my affiliates page and use that as your gateway to Amazon, you can support this podcast going forward more or less without thinking about it. So that and the other options can be found at samharris.org forward slash donate. And please know that your support in any or all of these forms is much appreciated and actually crucial to this enterprise. Now, although I have just boldly encouraged you to support this podcast, the timing of this appeal is peculiar, because I have just released what many of you consider to be the worst podcast in the history of the medium. If you listened to my last podcast, you will need no reminder of this. But if you haven't, I'm speaking about my conversation with Mariam Namazi. In truth, I think I probably shouldn't have released it. I did because I had buried my podcast with Omar Aziz, which was actually much worse and I received some flack for that. And since I had announced my conversation with Miriam in advance, and many of you were eagerly expecting it, I just felt my hands were tied. I, I was worried that some of you wouldn't trust my judgment in this area. And so I thought, you know, what the hell? Well, you know, let them hear a conversation that didn't really go anywhere worth going. Uh, so that's what I did. And um, I think it was probably bad for everyone that I released it. It certainly seems to have been bad for Miriam. Where she received a ton of criticism on social media, and reacted quite badly to it, and she seems to feel very burned by the whole experience, which frankly is understandable. She, she got absolutely scorched by many of you guys. Uh, well, let me just say, I, I, it seems to me that some of the comments, I didn't see all of what happened on social media, obviously. I mean, there, there were literally thousands of comments. But um, some of the comments directed at her, I thought, were far too mean-spirited. Uh, if you think you're doing me any favors by savaging one of my guests, you're not. No matter how weak that person's arguments were on the podcast, or even if they didn't even have any arguments and didn't even know that they didn't have arguments, I don't want people leaving this show only to get mercilessly trolled on social media. But most of your outrage was also understandable, because that was a very frustrating conversation. Uh, I saw one comment from a person who said that he'd been listening to the podcast on an airplane. And uh, the look on his face apparently conveyed so much anguish that the flight attendant came over to ask if he needed medical attention. 
Now, that is not the podcast experience I hope to bring you on a regular basis. So, if you hear that I've scrapped a podcast in the future because the conversation didn't work out, you'll understand why. You know, I consider the podcast with Miriam right on the margin of what is publishable. There was certainly something to learn from that podcast, but it's not a lesson that I need to inflict on you again and again. And as I said when introducing that podcast, I don't think the fault was all Miriam's. I think I have a lot of room to improve in this medium, and I hope to do that. So to whatever degree I contributed to making that conversation less enlightening than it could have been, I apologize to Miriam and to all of you. Now, the conversation I'm about to bring you was very smooth, and it's much more of a traditional interview than I usually do. I spoke to Michael Weiss, the senior editor at The Daily Beast, and co-author of a New York Times bestseller about the Islamic State, entitled ISIS, Inside the Army of Terror. And we focus primarily on ISIS and the civil war in Syria. And as you'll hear, Michael is just a fount of information on these topics. You might have to listen to this twice to get all the details here. Unfortunately, we had a few audio issues with Skype, so you'll hear a few irregularities there. But I think you'll agree by the end that listening to Michael talk about ISIS and the Syrian civil war has made you much smarter on these subjects. And you'll come away with a much clearer sense of how complicated U.S. foreign policy and the war on terror now are. And now I give you Michael Weiss. Well, I'm here with uh, Michael Weiss from The Daily Beast. Michael, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on, Sam. Well, listen, I, I know you as a writer and editor for The Beast, but why don't you tell me and our audience a little bit more about you and how you come to know so much about the Middle East, which is, I'm sure, going to be the, the bulk of what we talk about. Um, we just, what, what's, what's your background? And tell us about your book on ISIS and all the rest. So my background is in journalism. Uh, I started writing about the Middle East about 10 years ago, I think. Um, some of it was on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Uh, a lot of it uh, then became covering the so-called Arab Spring in 2011. I was working uh, at a London think tank, the Henry Jackson Society, and of all the countries that had been covered, the one that wasn't, which was just then um, in its infancy of a, an uprising against the government, was Syria. So it, it literally one day my boss sort of dropped it into my lap and said, here, you need to sort of assess this and, and tell us what we need to know. So it started with a survey of who the opposition on the ground was. We managed to get interviews with uh, activists and leaders of the so-called local coordination committees from every province in the country. There's a misconception that the Syrian revolution started when a dozen kids scrawled on the walls in Dera, but actually the earliest protests were registered in Damascus itself, in the old city. Uh, so, you know, in the very capital, in the, the heart of, of Assad's regime. Uh, and what struck me is, you know, we had seen in Egypt uh, to a lesser degree in Tunisia, although we can probably get into uh, some of that, uh, particularly how the media has covered groups like Ennahda. But we saw the, you know, sort of the late failure of radical hopes, uh, teenagers turning out in the streets of Tahrir Square, protesting a pretty vicious uh, authoritarian dictatorship. Um, and then, you know, it gets hijacked by um, religious extremists, or you know, as as they were depicted in the West, so-called moderate Islamists. So, so now, Michael, you're talking about what happened during the so-called Arab Spring, right? Right. And in and in Syria, what I was struck by was, you know, the people who were leading this uprising. I mean, they really were um, small D Democrats, and uh, you know, they had various views on which kind of country they wanted to model a future post-Assad Syria on. Some said uh, like Turkey, others said like Tunisia. Some many said like the United States or like France. But um, what we now one of the things that bothers me and one of the reasons I wrote this book on ISIS was to try and sort of turn back the clock to the very beginning because for a lot of people history began when ISIS stormed into Mosul in 2014. Um, and you know essentially this was always a jihadist insurgency. It was always being led by Al-Qaeda and, and other assorted elements. And you know one of the things that I'm most interested in in my work is the relationship between terror and state actors. Uh, and this is something that is uh, just characteristic of the region. Uh, and it even goes beyond the region now. I mean, I've done a lot of work on, on Russia's facilitation of jihadism, beginning in Chechnya, but also, you know, leading up 
to the, the Syria conflict. I mean, they've been sending jihadists into Syria um, because better they blow stuff up in Aleppo or in Raqqa than they do in Dagestan. And, and all of this gets elided in the, the way that the West tends to cover these things. But anyway, you know, Assad's relationship with the very element that now claims to be trying to overthrow his regime and establish a, an Islamic state, uh, I find fascinating. So one of the leitmotifs of our book, and I, I've co-wrote it with a Syrian national called Hassan Hassan, is to kind of um, you know dredge up some of this um, occluded history of uh, the way not only the Syrian government but also the Iraqi government under Saddam Hussein was um, you know if not necessarily a catalyst then at least an underwriter of much of the unpleasantness we're seeing now. Um, people forget, and you know it is true the Bush administration um, misrepresented and lied about a lot of the intelligence in terms of Saddam's relationship with uh, jihadi groups such as Al Qaeda. But it is also the case after the invasion of Kuwait in the first Gulf War, um, he inaugurated something called this, the Islamic Faith Campaign, which was an attempt to marry the Ba'ath ideology with Salafism. And the reason for this was he saw the greatest threat to his regime. Well, there were two. One was from Iran next door, with, with whom he had waged a brutal eight-year war. And the other was internally from Islamist elements, particularly the Muslim Brotherhood. So one of the unintended consequences of the faith campaign was people abandoned the Ba'athism and took up the Salafism. And a lot of these elements have wound up or they did wind up in the, the so-called uh, anti-American and anti-Iraqi insurgency in, from 2003 onwards. But now, funnily enough, a lot of these former regime elements are in the upper echelons of ISIS. You're, you're looking at uh, lieutenant colonels in the Iraqi army or agents of the Mukhabarat uh, intelligence services. And uh, some of the leading operatives, including those who constructed the ISIS franchise in northern Syria in 2013, um, they behaved very much like state-trained, almost Stasi-like intelligence operatives. Um, so this is something I think, you know, that needs to get addressed. And this is not by any means, uh, and, and I'm sure you want to talk about this, not to, uh, to undermine or dismiss the element and the currents of Islamic fundamentalism that run throughout ISIS. It's very much a prominent uh, factor, uh, particularly amongst the so-called foreign fighters or the Mujahideen coming around from around the world who think they're going to usher in the apocalypse. My, my thesis is at the very high level. You know, you we're being asked to, to presume that people who, as of 2002 or even early 2003, were drinking wine, wearing fit military fatigues with epaulets they had never earned, uh, keeping their 12 mistresses and their eight mansions scattered throughout the state of Iraq, that as of today, now that they've got the long black beard and the dishdasha, they really want to end, usher in the end times? Or is there perhaps a political project that's underlying much of what ISIS is doing? Uh, and I think that, that, that that's something that needs uh, greater discussion. And it's indeed, I mean, one of the, the sort of mainstays of my work is to try and figure out, you know, where the messianic or eschatological element ends and where the the political, literal state building begins for them. Well, let's talk about that because it, it's just a, a truly complicated situation, and I, it's a kind of a challenge to figure out how to talk about it and you know which thread to pull first. Just a few things I want to respond to, and then maybe we can figure out how to circle in on on the details. But the first thing is that, that what you said about the Russians exporting their jihadists, I had frankly never heard before. So that's very interesting. And that's kind of analogous to what the Saudis have done on some basic level. And just to this point about secular people cynically using religion and religious ideology to manipulate, recruit, and otherwise advance their political aims, there are obviously instances of that throughout history, and people often point to that as a sign that religion isn't really as important a variable as it seems. But what I always say at that point in the conversation is that it, it only works. A cynical, actually secular leader pretending to be devout only manages to whip up a mob or a political movement under the aegis of those religious ideas because the people on the ground really believe these things. I mean, it's, it's only a successful lever to pull because it's, it's attached to something. So it doesn't embarrass my overriding concern about the potency of religious ideology to have it pointed out that some significant subset of any ostensibly religious regime is actually staffed by cynical Machiavellian 
mustache twirling secularists who are just using the ambient level of religious sectarianism or religious faith for their political aims. Feel free to respond to that. But as you do, let's go into just what you think the psychological and political reality is in ISIS. If they have these ex-Bathists who, in fact, aren't religious, in fact, may even be apostates, what has happened? Have they converted? Does al-Baghdadi just not care who these people are? I mean, al-Baghdadi is, is sort of an outlier. Um, he has a PhD in Islamic studies from a, actually it's called Saddam Hussein University, believe it or not. Uh, and the, the only way he could enroll in that program is if his family had Ba'ath Party connections. So, I mean, this is the thing. A lot of people join the Ba'ath Party not because they were true card-carrying ideologues. And, you know, one of the, stu the stupider things the United States did after, of course, invading Iraq was uh, the debathification of the first three tiers of the party. So a lot of people, you know, engineers, doctors, professionals who had joined up just so they could get ahead in life and make a living were rendered unemployed. Um, with Baghdadi, he is an absolute true believer um, by all accounts. Uh, he, he actually does think that, you know, the, the armies of Rome will clash with the armies of Islam in Dabak, which is a town mm. in Aleppo province. You know, this is the great sort of chiliastic conspiracy that uh, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi had put forward. And with Zarqawi, it was always about bleeding into Syria. So that, that goal has been achieved. But, um, you know, I absolutely agree with you. Look, you know, life is complicated and messy. And even people who, you know, um, purport to espouse a, a, a totalist or pure ideology um, often have contradictory or alternative, um, you know, modes of, of, of thinking or, or systems of belief creeping in. So, again, I don't know. I mean, are these Baathists, are they quote-unquote secular or apostate? Not necessarily. They can have been radicalized or, or salafized uh, under the faith campaign or even just, you know, by the sheer brutality and, and chaos of uh, living in Iraq, uh, both pre- and post-Saddam. Um, but I think it is one of the more fascinating issues of, of looking at ISIS. And look, I mean, I'm an atheist like you, uh, you know, in our dearly departed friend Christopher Hitchens used to say that religion was just another form of totalitarianism. I think that was the kind of the driving force behind his critique of it is that, you know, he had kind of in some ways gone through it himself as a, as a believing Marxist and Trotskyist. You know, Raymond Aron called Marxism a Christian heresy. There, there are a lot of similarities, you know, uh, and, and this is why, by the way, you find people who come from, you know, secular or temporal ideologies essentially swapping one you know, totalitarianism for another and, and taking up, uh, you know, some extreme form of religion or not so extreme form of religion. Uh, in fact, one of the leading evangelical Christians uh, in the United States uh, discovered Jesus in a Moscow hotel room uh, mm -hmm. when he found a, a stray Bible. Marvin Olasky is his name. Right. He's actually Jewish, a Jewish Marxist who became an evangelical Christian. So things like that happen all the time. Uh, and and it's, it, this is not a, an attempt to embarrass, I mean, you know, I am a great admirer of your work and a co-thinker, um, so it's not an attempt to embarrass it. It is an attempt, though, to try and fully understand. Um, and again, you know, I, I want to show that ISIS does not exist in this vacuum of, of fundamentalism. It has state sponsors, or I should say not sponsors, but state accomplices, I mean, to this day, you know, it's, it's running all of Syria's natural gas industry and selling that natural gas back to Damascus, which claims to be at war with it. Mm -hmm. it. It runs most of the oil wells in eastern Syria and is selling oil not only to free Syrian army groups, but also back to Damascus uh, and to uh, smugglers in Turkey and Iraqi Kurds. Um, I mentioned Russia, and, and the reason I do is People think Vladimir Putin is this great counter-terrorist, right? I mean, he hates Islamic radicalism, and he, he, he went to war in Syria to destroy ISIS. Well, no. I mean, if you look at the metrics, 10%, according to the Pentagon spokesman uh, Steve Warren, 10% of Russia's sorties have been going after ISIS. Now, the rest have been go going after groups that range from nationalists to Islamists to jihadists, including the Al-Qaeda franchise. But, um, you know... With Putin, the, the, the goal, I think, is quite simple. It's, it's exactly what Assad and, and the Iranians' goal has been from the beginning, deprive the West of any attractive, credible alternative to the dictatorship in Damascus and make it a stark choice of the Takfiris on the one hand or you know, this secular war criminal on the other. And that's not really a choice because no one in the West 
as much as they may loathe Bashar al-Assad and, and hold him responsible as well they should for the destruction of the country, they don't think he's going to be flying planes into buildings in New York or mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. ISIS would if it could. Uh, and you know, one of the, 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 the real challenges, Sam, is ISIS has broken apart or, or cleaved away from al-Qaeda. And I keep saying that you know, we're now at a more dangerous point than we were right after 9-11 because uh, the, the way that al-Qaeda is going to compete with ISIS is, by, is through blood and fire and terror. And that's going to play out on the streets of Europe. It already has. Um, mm. it's, it's playing out in Turkey, which has suffered more ISIS attacks than any other country. So that's a NATO member. Uh, and eventually it's going to come here. I mean, arguably it did with San Bernardino, although that was a case of people being inspired by rather than being trained up and, and dispatched as operatives. Um, but yeah, you know, this is, we, we have underestimated them. At the same time, we have, I think, sensationalized them and treated them as, as this, uh, you know, apocalyptic bogeyman, when in fact, there is a pragmatic uh, component to what they're doing. I mean, the way that they've managed to take terrain, it's not because they're great fighters. You know, I did this, um, this long interview with a defector from one of their security services uh, who told me, they fight like lemmings going off a cliff. I mean, it's, it's, it's just you know, sort of a human wave of cannon fodder, particularly mm -hmm. when they go up against the Kurds in Syria. What they're good at is tradecraft, and also they understand the sociology of the region. Um, so where they have imposed their caliphate, the, what I call the briar patch of ISIS, is the Euphrates River Valley, mostly eastern Syria, western Iraq, the villages and hamlets and townships along that, that, that sort of continuum. Uh, and th these are areas that are occupied by Arab tribes, and which are essentially confederations of families that span across borders. Remember, ISIS is dedicated to the dismantling of Sykes-Picot, the artificial mm -hmm. states that have cobbled up after World War I. Well, to some extent, they have a lot to work with there because the families and the constituents of ISIS are spread, fanned across the region. I mean, you've got tribes in Iraq that are also in Saudi Arabia or in Kuwait or the UAE and so on. Um, and the tribes have, have, have lived for hundreds of years through a very simple human political calculation. Whoever is the master, you cut a deal with. Uh, and that master could be Bashar al-Assad, or before him Hafez al-Assad, or it could be Saddam Hussein, it could be the American occupying force of Iraq, or it could be ISIS. And it was just about how do we, how do we get our daily bread and how do we subsist? You know, the tribes have gray and black market economies. They need to, to make money. They need to be able to smuggle their goods and wares and so on and so forth. And the way that ISIS's predecessor, Al-Qaeda, was, was booted out of most of Iraq, was, it, it was so overweening and so brutal that the tribes, they didn't like the Americans, but they at least saw the Americans as a credible non-sectarian intercessory force that they could partner with to expel the Takfiris. Well, today... There is no credible non-sectarian force because in Iraq you have either ISIS or, let's be honest, Shia militia groups, which in many cases are as bad as ISIS mm. and are driven by the same kind of you know, apocalyptic zeal. It's only from a different sect of Islam, backed by Iran. Well, if you're a Sunni tribesman, you see these guys as you know, pogromists. They're going to come in and they might expel ISIS, but then they're going to burn your house down and they're going to take your son as a so-called collaborator and throw him into a dungeon and take a power drill and stick it into his head. So then here you're, without spelling it out, again, illustrating the mad work done by religion, whether it's religious belief or sectarian tribalism. When you ask why is ISIS so successful in gaining Sunni support and spreading, the answers are at least twofold, and, and both are religious. They, either the, the Sunnis support their view of takfirism, which you should probably define in a moment so as to not leave our listeners behind, but two, whether or not they support this extremist religious ideology, they are terrified of the Shia, who, as you say, will show up based on their own religious tribalism and mistreat them horribly. And again, we just have, you know, whether or not any particular people in power are in fact religious maniacs who believe the prophecies that they're advertising, but we have religion carving up the people's lives on the ground. So before you jump into further thoughts here, just define takfirism, and then let's start with that. Just define takfirism for the moment. So takfirism is the ideology of excommunication. Um, if, if, I'm, if I practice takfir, I claim that even uh, fellow Sunni Muslims are apostates, and that's a, essentially a death sentence. If I call you an apostate, it means you're, you're, you're marked for death and I should kill you. Um, ISIS is a takfiri organization 
in the sense that um, if you are deemed insufficiently pious as a Sunni, um, you'll be exterminated. Uh, now that's the that's the the, the sort of marketing and, and and how they present themselves. But again, there are exceptions. Um, they don't necessarily go around and make sure that all Sunnis um, share the exact same uh, religious construct as they. Although it is true, you know, they they will patrol the streets. They have a, a, a security unit called the Hizbah, which is essentially like the Saudi morality police. And you know, if you're not in mosque on Friday, you'll be punished and thrown into jail. Um, but you know. Takfirism is a controversial conceit even within the annals of Salafi jihadism. And in fact, um, you know, Osama bin Laden was always at odds with Abu Musa al-Zarqawi, the founder of ISIS in, you know, when it was known as al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, over this issue. Because Zarqawi was a genocidal maniac, pathological. Mm -hmm. I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's no, I don't think anyone would really uh, try to make it controversial that, that he was a true believer in all of this stuff. Uh, this is the guy who patented the the the, um, the dressing of Western or non-Western hostages in the orange Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib style jumpsuits, and then the beheading on video as he's reading these imprecations against the West and drawing moral equivalence between what the Crusader infidel Zionist conspiracy was doing in Iraq and now what he is doing in in retaliation. Um, but uh, what I find fascinating is you know Bin Laden. One of the issues he had with Al Qaeda, with his own franchise, essentially, was when they were going around blowing up Sunni mosques and I'm sorry, Shia mosques and Husaniyas. Zarqawi's goal was was very Machiavellian. You know, Sunnis are a minority in Iraq. They're the majority of Muslims worldwide, but in Iraq they're the minority. And the only way you're going to get Sunnis to reclaim the throne, so to speak, in in Baghdad, is if Sunnis from around the world pour into Iraq and turn it into this sign of shore of all-out total sectarian war and essentially exterminate the Shia. So his project was genocidal. Kill all the Shia, and in doing so, you will, you will prompt or foment their radicalization, as you say, I mean, drive them into these sort of um, you know, paroxysms of religious fervor. They'll be uh, run or overseen by Iran, which is the mothership of Shia Islam in the region, much the way that Saudi Arabia is for Sunni Islam. Uh, and these guys will go around and do what we saw them do for almost a decade in Iraq, form death squads, you know, the Badr Corps, a group called the League of the Righteous, the Hezbollah brigades, not to be confused with Lebanese Hezbollah. They were going around attacking American soldiers, but also attacking Sunni civilians, rounding them up and saying, oh, what's your name? It's Omar, so you must be a Sunni. Show me your ID card, right? Okay, so we're going to take you... Uh, under the cover, by the way, of being an Iraqi state institution. So, you know, if you were sick, the guy who drove the, the, the ambulance and who, who purported to take you to hospital would actually be a, a Shia militiaman in disguise, mm. take you to some dungeon and torture you and probably kill you. So Zarqawi wanted this to happen. He wanted the Shia to become, you know, religiously extremist and, and radicalized um, so that they would then attack the Sunnis and the Sunnis would be driven further into the fold of al-Qaeda. Uh, and then precipitate, of course, this what I call the international or global casting call for Mujahideen. So Iraq would become, in a sense, that the, the, another Soviet-Afghan war. People from around the world, from the Gulf, from Indonesia, from uh, you know Turkey, would pour in and join the ranks of Al Qaeda, and eventually Al Qaeda would subsume everyone and everything else, including other rival Sunni organizations. So remember, the insurgency in Iraq. You had groups that were Islamist. You also had groups that were nationalists, that just wanted the restoration of the Ba'ath Party or wanted Sunnis to be back on top. So it was very complicated. Um, but by, you know, look, we now know and we've seen ISIS became top dog um, because it had the most brutal methods. It uh, became the wealthiest organization. I mean, people forget that there's a lot of nonsense in, in the ether about who's funding ISIS. Well, ISIS is funding ISIS. By 2006, because they were controlling so much of the oil and illicit arms and contraband smuggling uh, you know, networks in Iraq, they had actually become wealthier than al-Qaeda to the point where bin Laden and, and Ayman al-Zawahiri had asked them for a loan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the, the, the subsidiary was meant to be financing the, the, the patron. Um, and this is, this is how they, they, they get on. And you know, again, the complicating factors here. ISIS, we have seen, um, takes anvils and jackhammers to priceless artifacts and archaeological wonders, world heritage sites as, as defined by UNESCO. Um, they also, though, what they don't smash up, they steal and they sell on the black market. Now, they justify this. And again, 
you know, it could be uh, they absolutely believe in this in this sort of codification system for artifacts, or it could be, well, look, you know, uh, what we what's too too large to smuggle out of the country has to be destroyed, and what's small enough to struggle uh, to smuggle rather, um, we can we can then sell and remunerate ourselves. But they they justified it as follows: if it's idolatrous art, uh, paganist, pre-Islamic gods being worshipped, um, such as the Temple of Baal, uh, that all has to go. If it's Babylonian or Sumerian coins, little trinkets uh, that we dig out of the sand, well, we can sell that. Mm. They have a whole department. Uh, actually, Abu Saif, the guy that was killed in the U.S. Special Forces raid in eastern Syria last spring, he was in charge of the antiquities smuggling for ISIS. And you know, they, 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 they do this like, I mean, it's almost like a Talmudic <laughs> enterprise of defining what can, can, can stay, what can go, and how you have to handle it, and how you have to ask permission mm -hmm. for stealing you know, the cultural patrimony of Syria and Iraq. It's very sophisticated. I mean, and you know, they, their pretensions of statehood are not really to be underestimated. We like to pretend like, no, they're just a guerrilla insurgency. They, they, you know, they really think, and again, whether it's motivated by religion purely or religion plus a sense of political restoration or Sunni revanchism, mm -hmm. uh, they believe that they are building a state apparatus uh, and the caliphate is a legitimate uh, international project. There's no, there's no, um, there's no self-deception about that. So it's been widely reported of late that ISIS has lost a significant amount of its territory and is showing signs of buckling under the pressure being applied to it. What do you make of those reports? Are they true? Is that wishful thinking? It's true, um, but up, only up to a point. So IHS, uh, which is a British defense firm, reckons that ISIS has lost 14 percent of its territory across Syria and Iraq in the last 18 months. 14 percent of territory is not that much. But it is significant in the sense that they have been pushed out of large quadrants of northern Syria by the Kurds. They have lost um, some significant terrain, rocks such as uh, Ramadi, which is a provincial capital of Anbar province that they had claimed in uh, last May. But what this does not account for is where else they have taken territory. Um, so for instance, ISIS has what's known as wilayats, which is uh, the Arabic word for province. These are essentially affiliate organizations that predate ISIS allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the leader of the organization. Uh, so Boko Haram, the Nigerian terrorist outfit in West Africa, uh, has pledged allegiance to ISIS. With the stroke of a pen, one could argue, hmm. ISIS gained 20,000 square miles of territory in West Africa with that pledge of allegiance. Now, does sure. that mean that they have absolute control or you know, uh, the, the kind of terrain uh, governance capability that they do in Syria and Iraq? No. But it does mean that they have people who are fired by their ideology and willing to die on their behalf. They have done similarly in Libya, which is now considered both a way station for foreign fighters who can't make the journey into Syria and Iraq, and also, um, depending on who you ask, a fallback base in the event that Mosul or Raqqa should fall. Uh, and they're doing this since Sinai, the, the, the outfit that took down the Metrojet airliner, a you know, Russian commercial plane killing over 200 people, um, that Wilayat Sinai is essentially a, a, a colonial outpost, if you like, of ISIS. So that, that aspect of their um, international project really can't be discounted. By the way, uh, their presence in Libya puts them about five, less than 500 miles away from the coast of Sicily. Mm. So you remember, I mean, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi says, if we're lucky, inshallah, we'll, we'll conquer Rome. Well, they're not going to conquer Rome, and I don't think even the, the, you know, the, the top ISIS guys believe that. But they can certainly come close enough to Europe, and we, as we know, and we, as we've seen in Paris and elsewhere, they're already in Europe with their sleeper cells and their sort of covert operatives, the invisible armies, as I like to, 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 to call them. Um, and this is the thing, and, and Sam, here is where, the, where absolutely religion plays a, a paramount role and what worries me the most. ISIS, uh, you know, if you're Baghdadi or if you're in his Shura council, you go to bed at night in, in Raqqa or Mosul or wherever you're hiding, and you know that you might wake up tomorrow and some guy you've never heard of who could have been living in his mother's basement in Albuquerque um, might take an AK-47 and shoot up a school and do it in the name of your organization. You know, the remote radicalization project, 
you know, the, the ISIS-inspired attack. Mm -hmm. That, I think, is going to be their stock and trade for acts of terrorism <laughs> abroad. Because, um, you know, people look to an organization that seems to be successful. doesn't matter how, ultra, in fact, the ultraviolence works in its, in its favor. It's for any kind of, you know, loser, lunatic element living in any part of, of the world, really. Um, and, and, you know, their, their state building, uh, the reason that this has to be successful for them is because it has to inspire people to join their ranks. If they're, if they're seen to be on the decline or on the back foot, they're not going to inspire as many operatives. Um, so look, they've taken a battering. I know there's a very complicated answer to a pretty simple question, but welcome to the Middle East. Yeah, no, they have ta they, They've taken a battering, but there's, they've shown a remarkable degree of resilience. And, I mean, as, as I'm talking to you, I just finished uh, an epilogue to the second edition of our book where we've, we've interviewed uh, people living in Deir Zor and, again, the Euphrates River Valley, which is their strategic heartland. And people there say, look, you know, I don't like ISIS, but I have no alternative. Um, in fact, because of U.S. airstrikes and the coalition bombardment, uh, the way I made a living has now been rendered obsolete. So I, I am sending my youngest son to join ISIS because at least he'll get a salary. ISIS pays like $400 a month to its fighters. Mm. And not only do they pay the fighter a salary, but they pay subsidies for the family members of that fighter. So, you know, if I were to join ISIS, I'd get $400 a month. My wife would get 200 and my, my 10-month-old daughter, I'd get money to pay for her baby food. So again, this is their hearts and minds approach. Um, it's very sophisticated and, and, and it's, it's been very successful. Uh, and they've lost money in the sense that the oil infrastructure has been um, pretty depleted. Although, and again, another Western misconception, they don't make most of their money from oil sales. I don't know where this myth came from, but it's, uh, it's a dangerous one. They actually make most of their money through running a petty bureaucracy of taxation and surcharging. The reason they want territory, well, one of the reasons they want it is with territory comes people, and with people comes the ability to charge if they're Muslim zakat, if they're non-Muslim jizya, which is, uh, you know, an Islamic tax. Uh, and not only that, like, if you're caught smoking cigarettes, ISIS will throw you in a cage for three days, but they'll also charge you money, charge you $1,000. You have to pay a fine. If you are seen to be a rival member of a rival organization or any kind of dissident or uh, resistance fighter to ISIS, if you flee a territory that they control, they'll take your house. So, you know, it's, it's jihadist eminent domain. They'll mm -hmm. take your house, they'll take your property, all of your assets. If you run a business, they'll take your business and, and all of its inventory. So they, they run a mafia-style state in addition to a, uh, a terroristic one. Right. Right. Well, you made some interesting points there. One is that you bring up the topic of affiliate groups like Boko Haram suddenly magnifying the influence of ISIS. And as you spelled out, there's really no clear line between an affiliate group and what we tend to call lone wolf attacks, people who are just inspired by um, the ideology of ISIS and join this global jihadist insurgency really entirely on their own devices, which you know anyone with a gun or an internet connection can now do. And I agree with you, that is a, that's my larger concern. Obviously, you know, having people who are extremely well-trained and battle-hardened emigrate to the West and try to get martyred while killing as many people as possible, that is kind of the worst case scenario. But, you know, it's good enough to sow terror just by being someone who gets radicalized in his mother's house and goes to a school and kills 20 kids. You can just imagine how few instances of that would be sufficient to accomplish a crazy overreaction and paralysis in any Western country. So given that, as you just pointed out, the compelling narrative of ISIS that will attract lone wolves and affiliate groups in perpetuity is anchored to their perceived success as a state, as a caliphate, well, then why not just go in and destroy them to the last man in a month, which presumably is within the capacity of the United States or some coalition of Western powers to do. Now, I'm sure part of your answer will be an acknowledgement of how horrific the collateral damage would likely be in that case. But let's talk about what it would take to defeat ISIS in the most humiliating and decisive way. And why aren't we doing that? So there's, there's two things I want to um, discuss to answer your question. First, 
the state building, um, you know, nothing succeeds like success. That's, that's a main element for sure. But there's another element that I didn't address. The reason that ISIS has been so persuasive in its narrative, what is its narrative? I should define that first. In, during Ramadan, in his debut sermon in July of 2014, at the El Zangi Mosque in Mosul, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi gets up and he delivers this sermon. And he says, you know, we are facing a, a, a global conspiracy led by the United States and Russia, backed by Iran and the Rafida, which is the bigoted term that jihadis use to describe Shia, literally means rejectionists, mm. um, and, and, you know, that this conspiracy is, is at war with Sunni Islam. And we, the Islamic State, are the only safeguards, the only defenders and guarantors of the Sunni Ummah. Now, that you might say, well, that's just par for the course for, you know, crazy messianic terrorist group. Everything's a conspiracy and everyone's part of it except them. The problem is, Sam, you know, in the last decade, if you're a Sunni living in the region or just, you know, you're, you're in a souk in, in Cairo or you're at some bazaar in Antakya, southern Turkey, what have you witnessed? The U.S. goes into Iraq, topples a minority regime of Saddam Hussein dispossesses, disinherits Sunnis from what had been a very pretty privileged and elite station, you know, ruling one of the major capitals of the region for 30 plus years. Uh, then revolution kicks off in Syria. Syria is a Sunni majority country. So between 60, 70 percent of the country is, is Sunni. Um, people are being barrel bombed. They're having Scud missiles dropped on their heads. They're having sarin gas deployed against them. They're having chlorine bombs deployed against them. Uh, their women and sons are being gang raped in prisons. Their whole families are being burnt alive. This is the thing. ISIS traffics in moral equivalents. They say, whatever we do, we can point to other enemies of ours who do just as much, and if not worse. There's actually truth in that. Uh, the Assad regime and its militias, many of them built by Iran, there's a consortium of them called the National Defense Force. They lock whole Sunni families in their house and they set the house on fire and let the family cook inside. ISIS points to all this and say, well, how come nobody has come to the rescue of Sunnis? All you, you, you stupid, you know, democratic or, you know, secular, uh, pro-Western, uh, you know, Uncle Tom's basically. You look, you look at NATO and you look at Washington and you beg them for assistance and they don't come to your aid. And for a while, Sunnis are like, well, you know, it's because, uh, it's because of Israel. You know, the Assad, as bad as he is, he's kept the Golan Heights quiet for 40 years, so the U.S. won't intervene because of Israel. Then it became, well, no, it's because Obama wants to make this nuclear deal with Iran and he doesn't want to rock the boat. Now it's creeped up right to the point of the ISIS conspiracy, which is, no, actually, there is a conspiracy against the Sunnis. Uh, the United States prefers the Shia. It wants to be in bed with Iran, uh, and it wants the Shia, led by the Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran, and backed by the militias in Iraq, and helped by Lebanese Hezbollah, and helped now by Syrian militias that are being built as we speak, these guys to be the janissaries of a new regional order. And the people who are going to pay the price are the Sunnis. But we outnumber everybody else, so we should pour into the ranks of ISIS. Or, if you don't like ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, the al-Qaeda franchise in Syria. Mm -hmm. And we have to defend ourselves. It's become a very, very compelling narrative. Now, in slightly churlish moments, I joke, it's hard to tell where ISIS conspiracy theory ends and U.S. foreign policy begins. Because if you listen to what President Obama has said, he gave three very evocative interviews. Um, David Remnick of The New Yorker, Tom Friedman of The New York Times, Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic. In each of the interviews, he was basically asked, well, don't you think that, um, that Shia jihadism, uh, you know, along the lines of what Hezbollah has got up to or the Quds Force has got up to, isn't that just as reckless and dangerous as the Sunni variety? And he kind of fudged the answer, and he made it seem like what Iran does, as awful as it might be, car bombings and so on, uh, there's a rationale to it. They're less reckless, they're more self-interested. Whereas with the Sunnis, well, these are the guys who brought us 9-11 and the Taliban, and they're all barbaric crazies. And mm. we really can't negotiate or, or, or parlay with them in any way. Sunnis see that as the legitimation of Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's worldview. Um, and I, I keep insisting, you know, the, the State Department, the U.S. government, all Western governments are putting a lot of money into the counter-narrative, or essentially anti-ISIS propaganda. 
And in private moments, you talk to these diplomats in charge of the programs and they tell you we're failing. And we're failing because we exhibit ISIS atrocities, but they exhibit their atrocities. And we don't understand why are people being driven into the arms of a group that's going to burn a man alive in a cage or blow up a car filled with guys with an RPG or drown you know, a collection of, of, of innocents in a cage in a, in a giant pool. And the answer is you focus on the snuff component of those videos, but you don't focus on the other 15 or 20 minutes. So let's take Muaz al Qasasba, you know, the burning of the Jordanian pilot. Mm. Um, this, was, this was the video that shocked the world, in many respects, even worse than the beheading of James Foley and Stephen Sotloff and the other American hostages. Who burns a man alive in, you know, alive in a cage? Well, that's a 20 minute video. The last five minutes of it is the, 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 the sort of violent pornography. The first uh, 15 minutes of it is what? Kasazba sat at a table um, wearing the orange Guantanamo style jumpsuit, uh, essentially being interrogated, although it's couched as an interview. And he's giving up all the operational tradecraft, all the, the operational uh, details of what Jordan and the other Arab countries of the region were doing against ISIS. So he was giving the number of sorties that the Jordanian Air Force was flying, the kinds of fighter jets they were flying, um, the names of other pilots he flew with, and you know, the attack formations and so on. ISIS used that and counterposed that with images of dead Muslim babies and women and children being pulled from the rubble as they claim victims of these Arab bombardment attacks. To ISIS, there is no such thing as a, an Islamic or a Muslim country in the contemporary Middle East. These are, these are the so-called near enemies. These are apostate regimes led by defunct and corrupt and venal dictatorships, monarchies, Hashemite, Wahhabist, whatever. But just to clarify here, this is a distinct complaint and allegation of conspiracy from the Shia Sunni sectarian civil war. Many of these regimes are Sunni that they're complaining about being attacked by. And that's one of the ironies of, of hearing the ISIS, um, the ISIS narrative sort of taken up by Sunnis. Sunnis have been, um, you know, the dominant sect just by sheer force of numbers. I mean, demography is destiny, right? But Sunnis are now behaving and acting and sounding like an imperiled minority, mm -hmm. like the Shia had done for decades, if not centuries, because uh, they are everywhere being besieged and embattled, and they feel like they're being taken over by Iran. Uh, and ISIS is taking this uh, and, and, and exploiting it like all hell. I mean, their propaganda, I don't know, Sam, if you, I mean, I have to, I have to watch these videos. Um, they're, they're some of the most sophisticated pieces of theater, agitprop, that I've ever seen. Mm. And again, I come back to the state training that people who are cooking these things up must have had. Um, you know, if you go back far enough, if, if, if a lot of guys from the Saddam regime were in ISIS, that means they were trained by the East Germans and by the Soviet KGB, right? And taught how to do information warfare and disinformation. Um, ISIS makes really ample use of this stuff. You know, for instance, the Daily Beast, where I work, we reported a story um, several months ago that the U.S. Defense Intel or Cent Central Command rather was cooking the intelligence. Analysts, 50 analysts, sent a complaint to the Pentagon Inspector General saying, "We're giving rather sobering." Um, battlefield damage assessments, uh, you know, in terms of ISIS's finances and its, its military capability, and these things are being rejiggered to suit the White House's public relations, which is ISIS is losing. Uh, ISIS took this and put it into one of their videos, and they counterposed that with images and, and statistics of the number of U.S. military veterans who commit suicide every month. Mm. And they're saying, look, you, you, this is a defunct empire. This, this is what happens when you don't have uh, you know, the true path of Islam as a guiding force in, in the construction of your, you know, your sort of global enterprise. Um, the United States will fall. And, you know, I, there's a former military intelligence officer sent me the video, American military intelligence. He said, you know, if I didn't know any better, I'd want to join these guys because this is very, this is very persuasive stuff. Mm. So they're taking a, what I, you know, what I would call the, the sort of geopolitical nervous breakdown uh, particularly afflicting the Sunni Muslim population of the Levant, Mesopotamia, but also the outlying countries. They're taking this and just, I mean, it's like damp putty in their hands. And it's one of the reasons that people aren't rising up against them. It's not necessarily that they espouse the Takfiri ideology. It's not necessarily that they have an Islamist ideology to begin with. It's that, you know what, if, if ISIS rules me and I keep my head below the parapet, 
and I just do as they say, and I go to mosque, and I kind of go through the pantomime motions of praying five times a day and all the rest of it, I'll be fine. But better then than the Syrian Arab army or Hezbollah or the IRGC, which is going to burn my house down just because I'm Sunni. So if you had control of the U.S. armed forces or coalition forces, what would you do at this moment? So look, what I'm going to say may sound um, controversial, and you may disagree with it. A lot of people do. Um, if anything, studying this subject matter has made me more realist in my foreign policy uh, prescription. Uh, to fight Sunni jihad, you need Sunnis. And given the players on the ground now, I don't go as far as David Petraeus, who said, hey, let's, you know, let's peel away uh, actors from Jabhat al-Nusra and work mm -hmm. with them to fight ISIS. I mean, Nusra is al-Qaeda. You don't need to go work with al-Qaeda to defeat ISIS. But you can work with other groups on the ground, uh, including those that you and I would deem very unsavory and we would never want to see um, you know, uh, controlling any lever of, of, of state or running any kind of government. Um, and the reason is, look, Sunnis will welcome in fellow Sunni Arabs. Uh, as liberators from ISIS-held you know, held territory. They're not going to welcome in the Kurds because they'll see the Kurds as conquerors. They're not going to welcome in the Shia for reasons I've already given at length. I would do more to build up a, a Sunni Arab gendarmerie or counterterrorism force to go after ISIS. But in order to do that, and we, tr we, we sort of kind of tried it with the Pentagon's train and equip program, you have to give them an incentive. And their, their chief incentive, the raison d'etre of the Free Syrian Army, which is really just a, a, a grab bag term to describe hundreds if not thousands of separate militia groups. The raison d'etre was to go after Bashar al-Assad. Well, I'm not saying you got to bust down the gates of the presidential palace, drag him out by his feet, and hang him upside down Mussolini style. Although many Syrians, and probably myself included, would, would love to see nothing better than that to happen at some point. But you have to isolate his regime and give protection to the civilian population and give protection to various opposition groups. And by protection, I don't mean seeing Samantha Power tweet, you know, messages of solidarity with the, the, the poor, terrible, embattled people of Syria. You have to give them some measure of military protection. Now, this has become all the more difficult in the last three months because Russia has mm -hmm. now installed a no-fly zone. And Russia's no-fly zone is really, you know, a... a a zone of, of bombing with impunity. And as I mentioned, they're going after everybody but ISIS. But in the eastern parts of Syria, the, the Sunni tribal areas, you know, a program to, to weaponize and incentivize those guys to, to rise up against ISIS, um, that would work. Now, I, I can't give you the exact logistics of how you do that. I mean, I'm not a military planner. But if you talk to people who, especially the veterans from the Iraq war, the military intelligence side, the diplomatic side, people like Robert Ford, Derek Harvey, Joel Rayburn, they'll tell you, like, you, you're going to need this constituency on your side. And right now, we're running such a deficit in trust and credibility with them that it's a real uphill battle to, to win them back over. And the only way you can win them over is if you convince them, actually, the U.S. does care about the plight of the Sunnis. And the first order of business is at least containing the Assad regime. Right. Not acquiescing to its, its reconquering of land, not sort of, you know, ignoring its human rights abuses. I mean, the U.N. came out with this report this week uh, of, of all detention facilities in Syria run by Assad, Nusra, and ISIS. And the one that, that's run by Assad and his, the four branches of his intelligence service, they said, is conducting a campaign of extermination. Well, again, you know, if you're, if you're on the ground in Syria and you, you, you don't have to read that, you're living it. But if you're being exterminated and nobody's coming to your rescue, why the hell are you going to become a counterterrorism proxy for the United States, mm. a country that's leaving you to your fate. So in terms of what, we'd, what would I do militarily, look, um, you know, you've got your, your, your Ted Cruz's who say, just carpet bomb the hell out of eastern Syria and don't worry about the humanitarian uh, expense, uh, leaving aside committing war crimes, gross human rights abuses. Everything I just mentioned to you, you know, kind of the, the, the psychological or the sort of zeitgeist component to why ISIS is succeeding, all of that will literally go up in flames if you just further bomb and, and disinherit and, and sort of, you know, exterminate is the only word I can think of, the Sunni Arab constituents that are being ordered over by ISIS. You need them on your side. There's a few questions that yeah. sprung into my mind as I heard that last bit. So one, how would empowering local militias of whatever jihadist stripe against ISIS 
not prepare the same disaster for us that we created with al-Qaeda and famously suffered blowback having armed them against the Soviets. Two, how would going after Assad to whatever degree not risk us having to fight a hot war with Russia or Iran or both? And three, why couldn't our going after ISIS be more circumscribed than that, where we would say, listen, we support all the sane Sunnis on earth. We know you don't have much fondness for a group that thinks that the end times are going to come in sometime in the next 15 minutes, and they're happy to decapitate journalists and aid workers in the meantime to bring that on. So we're going to align with this bogus prophecy. We're going to meet them in Dabik, and we're going to kill every last one of them just to prove that this is all bullshit. Okay, well, so before I start, you ask three questions, before I yeah. answer any of them, when you say we... I mean, what, who's going to meet them in Dabak? We're going to send U.S. military forces yeah, yeah, to it could, Syria? Yeah, it could be. I mean, that's the simplest case. That or a coalition of the none too willing. Right. Well, look, um, here's, again, I defer to people who've actually fought in these wars and who understand the terrain and, and the nature of the enemy. Um, U.S. special forces are saying, let us at them. We can cut like a hot knife through butter through all of the so-called caliphate and just kind of, you know, scalp these these guys. Um, they don't think it's going to require very many troops on the ground to meet that objective. Mm. So perhaps, I mean, you're right. Uh, I, I happen to think, yeah, look, um, of course, ISIS is going to say, you know, we dare you to come in here and usher in the apocalypse. I mean, that, that suits their interest, right? They don't want American troops, um, particularly because they know that American troops would partner with these local militias. We would enfranchise and weaponize them, much as we did in Iraq and Al-Anbar province and, and uh, Nineveh and elsewhere. And that would be the end of ISIS. And, and you have only to look at what ISIS is saying and to see just what really drives them nuts and where their paranoia comes from. One of the main planks of their propaganda is to forestall another awakening. You know, the, the, the tragedy of, of Iraq is we forgot all the lessons we learned of how to turn these populations against the jihadists, but the jihadists remembered all the lessons and all their mistakes. So, you know, for instance, um, ISIS has one of its p most powerful propaganda videos is called Clanging of the Swords, which shows them going around house to house uh, and rounding up all the sheikhs and the tribesmen who partnered with the Iraqi government and the U.S. military uh, and executing them, making their kids dig a mass grave and beheading them and dumping the bodies into the grave along mm -hmm. with their children. And that image is juxtaposed with um, images of mass repentance rallies. If you were part of the awakening councils in Iraq, if you joined with the Rafida conspirator, the Rafida crusader conspiracy, all will be forgiven if you turn in your weapons, tear up your ID badges and pledge allegiance to ISIS. So they're, they're absolutely terrified of, you know, these militias kind of coming back and, and a real grassroots rebellion against them. And that tells me that they know that they're on borrowed time with these guys. And if, if there were a U.S. military presence, um, a presence which would, of course, not go around doing anti-Sunni pogroms, but partner with the local communities once the, the ISIS element had been expelled from the towns or cities or villages, that would be the, the death knell for them, at least strategically speaking. So to that extent, sure, um, that, that's a possibility. Now, when you say um, deploy military troops to Syria, well, you know, one of the, the questions you asked me about, well, wouldn't this sort of start a proxy war or not so proxy war with Russia, Iran, and Assad? Well, yeah, uh, but, you know, you've got Russian special forces in northern Syria already. We know they're operating in Latakia province. I've heard they've been deployed uh, elsewhere, such as Homs. Uh, what happens if U.S. special forces get into a firefight with Spetsnaz. You've got uh, thousands upon thousands of Revolutionary Guard Corps officers headed by Qasem Soleimani in northern Syria, particularly in Aleppo. We know this because a lot of them are being sent back to Tehran in boxes and then buried under state obsequies as martyrs in a foreign land. You've got Iraqi Shia militias, believe it or not, League of the Righteous, the Hezbollah brigades are being deployed from Iraq into Syria to prop up Assad. Um, you know, you have, there is, no, there is no real single conflict in Syria anymore. It's just a, a conglomeration of sideshows. So you risk, you risk running into something nasty no matter which way you, you play it. Now, I'll, I'll give you some evidence um, as to how this unfolds because we've actually seen it before us right now unfolding. Um, 
when Russia invaded Ukraine, one of the arguments against uh, arming the Ukrainian military with Javelin anti-tank missiles was, well, if a U.S. anti-tank missile is shot by a Ukrainian soldier and blows up a Russian T-82 tank, won't that start World War III? Like, that's the U.S. at war with Russia, right? Well, in Syria, the CIA has been running an anti-tank missile known as the Tau to um, 39 different Free Syrian Army units small little brigades or battalions that they have vetted and they trust to handle this material with care and not give it over to any nasty element such as Nusra or ISIS. Recently, Tau anti-tank missiles have killed at minimum two Russian soldiers. One was a helicopter pilot who was on the search and rescue mission for the downed or for the, 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 the one surviving pilot from that downed Russian aircraft that the Turks shot out of the sky a few months ago. Mm. And the other, it happened last week, in Latakia, in Jabal al-Akhrad. Um, there was a rooftop building filled with Russian military officers, at least one of them that based on what I can piece together from the Russian media, but probably more. And a Syrian rebel group armed with a towel blew up the, the rooftop, killing Russians. So you have, in miniature, a replay of the Soviet-Afghan war, where the U.S., where the CIA is covertly running guns to an, you know, a Muslim asset, and the Muslim asset is using it against the, the, the Russian army. Uh, it hasn't prompted World War III yet. And you know, knowing what I do of the Putin regime and how the Kremlin behaves, if Syria were to turn into another Afghanistan, if Russian pilots or jets or helicopters were blown out of the sky, or if Spetsnaz soldiers were sent home, the so-called cargo through 300 in, in coffins, that would probably precipitate a recalculation on the part of Putin as to whether or not this adventure is succeeding. Russia has only managed to gain 1.3% of territory back for the Syrian regime. And it's been three months, and at untold costs of hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, from Russian state coffers. So we haven't exacted a price for Russia intervening against us uh, in Syria. Uh, so there are options. I mean, you know, the, the logic or the rationale, really more of an excuse that I hear for why America doesn't do anything to militarily engage, you know, essentially Iranian forces in Syria, is if we do that, the Iranians will turn their weapons against us in Iraq, where despite what the White House tells you, you've got almost 5,000 U.S. servicemen stationed in Iraq, plus another 7,000 U.S. contractors. Well, we haven't really been fighting the IRGC in Syria, and that still hasn't stopped their proxies from kidnapping three American contractors in Baghdad. This happened within the last few weeks. So, you know, when we do nothing or when we say to our enemies, how can we help you? I mean, what, what do you want us to do not to antagonize or provoke you? you know, they treat us like dirt anyway. They walk all over us. So yeah, there, there are a lot of ways you can at least, you know, bring a bigger beating to ISIS. And it starts, though, with this socio-political campaign that has to be driven home with fire and steel, not with rhetoric and not with conferences in Switzerland that nobody wants to attend because they're being barrel bombed. Uh, so you have to give Sunni Arab military uh, proxies. You have to give them some support. Otherwise, again, you're not going to flush ISIS out of its briar patch in the Euphrates River Valley. The Kurds can't do it, and they're our most trusted and reliable ally because they fight really well, and they're not jihadi. They're secular, mm. quasi-Marxist, basically. I mean, that's, that's what the PYD, which is the affiliate of the Kurdish Worker Parties, Kurdish Workers Party in Syria, I mean, that's their ideology. Um, but they, they know that they can't march into Raqqa City or Deir ez nor they want to, because they're going to be slaughtered by the local community, not by ISIS. They'll be seen as, as conquerors, not liberators. Why haven't we supported the Kurds more than we have? Um, well, this is, this is where it also kind of enters into uh, Alice in Wonderland mode. So, as I say, the, the most trusted ground force in Syria for the United States is the YPG militias, which are essentially wholesale um, paramilitaries of the Kurdish Workers' Party's Syrian affiliate. Um, the Kurdish Workers' Party is designated by Turkey and the United States as a terrorist organization because for 40 years they've waged an on-again, off-again insurgency against the state of Turkey. Now, you know, people listening to the program and you and I would say, well, look, Tayyip Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is a megalomaniac and he's also an Islamist. Mm. You know, we've seen his sponsorship for Hamas. We see what he's doing to journalists in his country. Let me tell you, though, uh, AKP 
and the, the ruling party in Turkey and Erdogan, it doesn't matter if you installed a Kemalist or a, a, a secular CHP man uh, in the, at, at the head of state. The, the, the Turks will always see foreign policy and national security through the prism of, of Kurdish separatism. There is no political element in the country of Turkey, modern Turkey, that sees the PKK uh, as a friendly political or military element in its midst. The only exception to that rule, of course, are PKK-aligned Kurdish parties in Turkey. Mm. Um, so the U.S. is not doing more to back them, although we're doing plenty. I mean, we are giving them close air support. U.S. Special Forces deployed in northern Syria are partnering with the PYD. We're arming them to mm. some extent. Brett McGurk, who is the envoy to the anti-ISIS coalition, was recently in northern Turkey meeting with the PYD, uh, much to the exasperation of the Turks. But so here you have the world's largest NATO member state facilitating, you know, underwriting, arming, backing, essentially a terrorist organization as seen by the second world's largest army of NATO. Uh, it's a big contradiction in the way of this, of, of, of you know, putting forward this anti-ISIS strategy. It's also one of the reasons that Turkey doesn't really want to be part of this coalition. It's turned a blind eye to ISIS's aggregation on mm. its southern doorstep. I've reported from, from the Turkish border. I've seen the way that anyone can walk across it, although that has changed in recent months. There is some evidence uh, that's been reported that uh, the Turkish intelligence service, MIT, uh, has, um, has basically if not partnered with ISIS, then, then sort of, you know, ignored the rising threat or, or possibly even worked with them at some point just because they saw them as an antidote to the Assad regime. So Turkey has not been a, a reliable ally, but the U.S. has not really returned the favor by helping. I mean, this, the equivalent of this, Sam, would be like, uh, you know, Barack Obama saying to Israel, right, we're going to work with Hamas and we're going to allow them to build a state on your doorstep. That's how the Turks see the PKK. Right. I'm not drawing moral equivalence. I'm just explaining it to, to you as, as their national security issue. Yeah, uh, yeah. But with respect to the Kurds of northern Iraq, again, this is very complicated. The Kurds of northern Iraq don't like the PKK any more than the Turks do. Because again, Kurdish politics, we think of the Kurds as this monolithic entity. But they're like everyone else. They have rival groups, rival ideologies, and, and different uh, political actors who want to essentially take over the entire, uh, well, in this case, the, the diaspora. The, the party in northern Iraq, the KDP, headed by Masoud Barzani, uh, runs you know, the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga did a piss poor job of defending Sinjar from, from ISIS's onslaught in 2014. It's one of the reasons that the Yazidis were put to the sword and genocide was committed. The people who bailed out Sinjar were the PKK. So there's a, an intra-Kurdish conflict taking place at the moment. And you know, the, the side that we have characteristically backed is Barzani and the KDP. Now that's beginning to change, and we're working more with the PKK. So it's, it's, the whole thing is a mess. I mean, like mm -hmm. I say, you know, the, the war against ISIS has, has really um, catalyzed the, the law of unintended consequence. And you have to be very wary of what, what the long-term effects are going to be. When ISIS is gone, the Middle East will not look the same as it did before ISIS got there. There will be a, an independent statelet of Kurdistan in northern Syria, which I guarantee is going to give rise to all kinds of conflict and violence and war with Turkey. Um, in, in Iraq, you have had the, the construction of a Hezbollah-style deep state overseen by the Quds Force. These militias, they're not just going around and acting like death squads any longer. They're actually becoming part of the political establishment. They're going to take over, you know, whole provincial governments, they're going to take over a, you know, a chunk of Iraqi parliament. They may even get somebody to be prime minister one day. So you, know, you have to be mindful of how the cure might, if not be worse than the, than the disease, the cure could also kill the patient on the table. Um, and this is, this is one of the, the, the real problems with, with the way that this strategy against ISIS has been prosecuted. Um, we're not thinking long term, we're thinking short term. So do you think that you simply can't address the ISIS problem separate from figuring out how you want to address the Assad problem? I mean, I'm imagining that you could say, listen, we hate Assad as much as the rest of the Sunni world does, but that situation is complicated. We're going to go over here and destroy ISIS for the time being, and then we'll solve the Assad problem. Is that just a non-starter politically and tactically? Logically, if, if Assad is, as John Kerry put it, uh, a magnet for Sunni terrorism, Leaving him in place just means you're going to draw more Sunni terrorists into Syria. So you're not going to physically be able to address the ISIS problem to your satisfaction without at least engaging or containing 
al-Assad. But we're still, I mean, in, we're talking about numbers. I think the last I heard, we thought ISIS had managed to draw in something like 40,000 international recruits. I don't know. Is that still a current number? Um, I think it's dropped now. And it's definitely true that foreign fighters are having a harder time getting into the so-called caliphate country. Right. Um, so these numbers are, we're not talking about a million man army. We're talking about tens of thousands of people. So, But, but you're, what, what, what that neglects is, you know, we're talking about foreign fighters, but it, you're not talking about domestic fighters. It's the people that ISIS lord over. You know, this, right. is the, this is the part of the problem. Like, what defines an ISIS member? Is it somebody who pledges allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi? Technically, yes. But if I'm a citizen living in Raqqa or Derzor or Palmyra, and I'm, you know, ISIS is, is ruling me, I am part of the caliphate, whether I want to be or not. And I can be conscripted as cannon fodder or a suicide bomber into the army. I can be, you know, sent off. And like I mentioned, the economic constraints of or are driving people into the arms or the, the, the ranks of ISIS because families can't survive any other way. At least if mm -hmm. I send my son, you know, I, my family will be paid for. So the domestic population, remember, ISIS rules millions of people. So it has yeah. a, pretty, yeah. a pretty large recruitment pool already within the zone of territory that it, it controls. But again, even if you were to expunge ISIS from Raqqa and Mosul, that is the, that is the twin hammer blow to the caliphate, they lose their command and control, the whole state building edifice crumbles. Does that mean, though, that ISIS is gone or eliminated as an international security threat? Well, they still have an active franchise in Egypt. They've got, you know, their control of at least parts of three major uh, cities or towns in Libya. They're creeping into Afghanistan and giving the Taliban a run for its money. They're popping up all over. There is even an element of them in the North Caucasus of Russia. Mm. Um, so they can wage terror attacks from those, those areas uh, just as well as they can, frankly, from anywhere. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of how do you contain the, the ideological fervor? How do, you, how do you make it, how do you disincentivize Muslims to join up with this organization? Yeah, yeah. That is the most important question from my point of view. And despite what may seem implicit in my recent line of questioning of you, I fully agree that the best thing to do would be to have Sunnis somehow contain the problem, whether that's, you know, indigenous militias or Sunni neighboring states deciding that they need to send armies in to deal with ISIS just given how inflammatory it is to have an army of infidels and Christian crusaders going in and dealing with it. And it, it comes back to this crucial issue of how do you make jihadism ultimately as ideologically unattractive as Soviet-style communism now is? And so that, that's the magical change of hearts and minds we have to accomplish in the Muslim world. But it does come back to some of what you said earlier, that just no matter how decorously we walk on eggshells amongst our enemies, we still never get much credit for doing so. And we, we look more and more like a paper tiger. And there are there is some subset of the Muslim world, and I would put all of the jihadists into this category, that only understands stark power differentials and uses of force. We're never going to behave so well as to align the jihadists with our interests. And I think there's an open question of, about whether we could behave so well as to align Islamists more generally with our interests. And so it's a question of, you know, what is the most compelling communication that will, will convince the maximum number of the world's potential recruits to Islamism and jihadism that they're on a collision course with the 21st century. They have to figure out how to live in a pluralistic cosmopolitan world that respects human rights and democracy and all the rest. And if they don't do that, in short order, they're going to find their hopes and dreams just plowed under by the strongest militaries on earth, whether that's America or it's America in concert with 30 nations. Well, that, look, that, you know, what the, the, the element of, of, you know, the enfranchisement of women, um, the, the right to free 
inquiry and in a kind of you know civilized education, um, you know minority rights, everything that we sort of take for granted in the West. That is something that can only be sorted out by the people of the, the region and, and the practitioners of the faith. Uh, there's no question. I don't think the United States, um, apart from defending dissidents, be they you know bloggers in Riyadh or you know homosexuals in Tehran, I don't think the United States really has that big of a role to play there. What I'm talking about is um, geopolitics and you know essentially an active war being waged on the one hand by 62 nations to some extent really uh, you know just three or four I mean mm. you know all of the Arab countries that have been part of this coalition have stopped bombing you know this is one of the great sort of misconceptions we say oh we've got Saudi Arabia UAE Jordan remember King who's King King Abdullah Jordan was going to I mean he was like on the cover of Esquire like Russell Crowe after Muz al Qasasba was burnt alive he was going to march into Raqqa and wring mm -hmm. Baghdadi's neck himself as of I think October uh, maybe even earlier Jordan just stopped bombing uh, and they stopped bombing because they can't afford to have another pilot downed and another incident like that repeated and also and this is something we, you know, we didn't get into, but we probably should at some point or maybe for the next podcast. Internally within these countries that are putatively on America's side is this element, this current of Salafi jihadism, which mm. if not sympathetic with the ISIS project is perhaps sympathetic with Al-Qaeda's project. Um, for instance, when Jordan was negotiating with ISIS for the release of Qasasba, who did they use to negotiate on their behalf? Abu Musab al-Zarqawi's former mentor, al-Maqdisi. Hmm. They used Abu Qatada, once described as al-Qaeda's lieutenant in Europe, also the happiest man in London because he was under house arrest paid for by the British taxpayer living in a dilapidated mansion in North London for a while until he was extradited to Jordan. They used two known al-Qaeda jihadis or hmm. al-Qaeda theoreticians to try and parlay with what has become an ultraist offshoot of al-Qaeda. And they failed, and ISIS humiliated them and abased them by, by having the man burnt alive, even whilst they were continuing the pantomime of negotiations. Mm. So this is something, too, to consider. There is, a, there is a debate taking place within the annals of jihadism. Westerners could care less, I'm sure, but it's important because it, it's, this, is, this is resulting in this. It's a, it's a combination of a cold and a hot war between al-Qaeda, our first enemy after 9-11 or before 9-11, and ISIS. Uh, and they're fighting each other. And as I mentioned earlier, one of the ways that they're going to fight each other is by racking up an infidel butcher's bill and doing so on the in, in the streets of Europe and the United States. Right. Um, but look, you know, in answer to the question of, well, you know, we need to destroy and degrade or whatever the, the going euphemism of the day is, ISIS. It, look, it, it, it comes down to learning from recent history. How did ISIS you know, reassemble? How did it become strategically on the front foot again in Iraq? It didn't just happen overnight, and it wasn't just because of the Syrian revolution next door. In 2010, Nouri al-Maliki, who was an Iranian stooge, and essentially, you know, the Shia Saddam, at least if you're Sunni, mm. didn't win re-election, but the U.S. Allow, allowed him to steal that election and backed him. And you can, there's a great definitive history of the Iraq war called the end game where there's some really unbelievable quotes from Vice President Biden um, and also from the, the U.S. ambassador to Iraq at the time, uh, Chris Hill. Biden said, we know Maliki hates the goddamn Sunnis, but you know, he's the only one who can really form a government, so let's help the Iraqis violate their own constitution, which we helped them write, by the way, and reinstall Maliki in the driver's seat. Maliki proceeded to suppress protest movements all throughout uh, Iraq through violence, um, you know, similar to what Assad was doing in 2011. But even more than that, all of the, the Awakening Council guys, all of the, the, the Sunni Arab, the Sunni tribesmen who had turned against al-Qaeda, who then expected to be incorporated into the Iraqi state institutions, you know, policing themselves, uh, having a national guard, or, or you know, being, uh, you know, paid a salary as members of the Iraqi security forces. They were all hung out to dry because Maliki didn't trust them. He didn't like them. And he had his own project, which was a kind of boss tweed style uh, Shia stand creation, in, mm. beginning in Baghdad and then extending into to, to southern Iraq. ISIS came back because the very element that we had worked with to expel them welcomed them back in as an alternative to Baghdad and behind Baghdad, really, Tehran.
These were mistakes the United States made. Right. But it seems like we're poised to make that mistake if we follow your initial piece of advice, which is to arm nearly as radical Mujahideen against ISIS and then hope that the aftermath of that victory is going to be more palatable than ISIS itself. The al-Qaeda theorists who are negotiating on behalf of Jordan to win back their pilot, here we're in, into territory that is a distinction without a difference. Yes, it's, you know, they're not as bad as ISIS, say, at least in that local instance, but we're just as at war with al-Qaeda and everyone like al-Qaeda as we are with, with ISIS. Just to reiterate, Sam, I mean, you know, I mentioned earlier, David Petraeus, he caused a lot of scandal when he made these comments about working with Nusra. I don't, I don't recommend anything close to that. Um, but, you know, the, the, the U.S. and the West has put so much scrutiny on who's the Syrian opposition and we don't know who they are. And they're all, doc you know, on the one hand, they're either, um, you know, sort of lapsed professionals, as, as, as Obama put it, doctors and farmers and engineers. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they're all al-Qaeda. Well, no, I mean, you know, even to this day, there are elements on the ground in Syria that, that the West can partner with and work with. Um, they're better than Hamas. Um, not as bad as al-Qaeda and certainly not as bad as ISIS. And here's the news. They're already fighting ISIS and to some extent fighting Nusra. It's true a lot of Syrian rebel groups, including ones the U.S. is working with, fight alongside Jabhat al-Nusra. But again, why are people joining Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria? Is it because they're al-Qaeda ideologues or because they see them as a credible, disciplined cadre of fighters that is actually taking the fight to Assad and making gains? It's more the latter, and I can give evidence. I mean, there are people who were part of the protest movement in 2011, 12, got disillusioned with them, joined another Islamist group, didn't like them, joined Nusra, then saw Nusra as being overweeningly brutal and medieval, and left and went back to, you know, if not being a protester, then became a refugee and fled. So there is a, a fluidity here, or militias, and, you know, this is, this is to betray us this point. People we call cleaved away from al-Qaeda in a bit, 2007 to 2009 period. Um, you know, yeah, a lot of them were Islamists. A lot of them had been responsible for blowing up soldiers, U.S. soldiers, British soldiers. But, you know, we needed them because, A, they knew where the bodies are buried. They knew the logistics, the networks, how to find these guys. They shared credible intelligence. We left Iraq and we're in the right. process of leaving Afghanistan. So doesn't that tell you that we don't have the stomach for for a, a multi-decade effort to to pacify the region? If that's the case, then look, then I, I really don't have any solution because you know America will suffer. As I said before, you know, it's 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 the old Trotsky line about you may not be interested in the dialectic, but the dialectic is always is always interested in you. Mm -hmm. Same thing applies to the Middle East. You know, the isolationist argument doesn't really work unless you're prepared to not get involved and still suffer and still be attacked and harmed, because that's exactly what's going to happen. You know, if we didn't pick a fight with ISIS, they would pick a fight with us. Um, and uh, insofar as, as there's now, I mean, you know, also beware of the, the long, long-term consequence. So I've, I've given you a kind of broad sketch of the contours of the changing Middle East. You know, a statelet of Kurdistan led not by America and Turkey's ally, the KDP, but led by the PKK. Um, you know, Assad would, will, will create, whether or not Aleppo falls in the next few weeks or months, is looking to create essentially an Alawistan for his sect and whatever uh, loyalist minority groups have aligned with it out of fear of the Sunni jihadis. Um, ISIS still controlling these briar patch regions of eastern Syria, western Iraq. Shia militias in control of most of the green zone in Baghdad uh, and everything south. Um, and Iran, which is exporting not just military uh, capability, but Khomeinist principles, Khomeinist ideology to Yemen, to, well, obviously Lebanon, to the occupied Palestinian territories, everywhere, which is also driving the Sunni Arab countries nuts. Mm -hmm. This changing Middle East, uh, the U.S. can either try to accommodate it and be a part of, of managing the fallout, or it can do nothing um, and just await what happens next. Uh, ISIS is not going to be, I mean, remember, before there was ISIS, there was Al-Qaeda, and we all thought, hey, there's nothing worse than this, right? I mean, 9-11, the worst terror attack on American soil since Pearl Harbor. If ISIS could do more, they'll do more. 
Uh, if ISIS is gone, who's to say there's not going to be ISIS 2.0, some here to, you know, uh, as of now unknown entity that will arise from the, the chaos of the region. Um, but my, my concern, my criticism is we are actively underwriting and facilitating the creation of this new Middle East without any, you know, any cognizance of the long-term consequences. Mm -hmm. And they will be anti-American consequences. Oh. I mentioned to you, like, you know, you've got three Americans in captivity, reportedly in Sadr City, Baghdad. And you've got over 10,000 Americans stationed in Iraq as part of a non-boots-on-the-ground military effort, which is mostly advisory in nature. But still, um, what happens if Americans start dying again, get, getting captured or killed? If we deploy troops to Syria and Iraq, what happens if they get captured or killed? Um, you know, U.S. military, I mean, everybody I interviewed in my my book, by the way, uh, all the former, they're mostly colonels. So if you know, I mean, colonels win a war, generals take credit for it. Mm. All the colonels say, um, we'll be back in both of these countries, or we'll be back in Iraq for sure in a combat role, but we will eventually be back, be in Syria. Um, and I take that very seriously because that's a, that's a sobering assessment, uh, whatever the American electorate believes. Look, if, if ISIS wages um, something like Paris in the United States, and by wages I mean you know, they send operatives mm. like Abd Islam, uh, you know, and Abud uh, into our country. Uh, I think the electorate's stomach for a long fight is going to change. And I think people will have forgotten, you know, the Iraq war, Afghanistan, and just want to kick the shit out of these guys. One of the most depressing things you said is your description of how hamstrung the Jordanian regime is, given the loss of a single pilot, how they can't afford to lose another, and they have to worry about their own Salafi-style lunatics in their midst. So again, I recall all of the sword rattling after the pilot was killed, and the fact that they can't get it into their heads that they need to fight ISIS after that. Just extend that analysis to the Saudis as well and any other neighboring regime we want to help us in fielding a Sunni force against ISIS. One, why can't we apply more pressure to these regimes, and in particular the Saudis, and get them to stop exporting the ideology that has caused this problem in the first place? Yeah, well, most of these regimes, again, this comes back to the old um, theme of, of the state's relationship with non-state terrorism. Um, so absolutely the Saudis have been a you know, kind of cottage industry of exporting Wahhabi-style Salafism, which, I mean, th those main currents have, have absolutely infiltrated and, and helped shape the ISIS ideology. Um, but in, since the 90s, uh, it is the case that the Saudis have been very fearful of blowback from this. You know, the, 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 the underwriting of the radical madrasas has somewhat diminished. The guy who's now, I think he's second in line to the throne, Mohammed bin Nayef, he was nearly blown to bits by al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. He's in charge of their Syria file, by the way. Um, mm. He's also one of the few Saudi officials that the U.S. respects uh, on a counterterrorism premise. Um, so the Saudis, you know, in, when the Syrian insurgency started, most of the people that they were backing, groups like the Syrian Revolutionaries Front, um, the, the, the Hazm movement, you know, these were groups that were more or less palatable to the United States. Uh, when King Abdullah died and King Salman came to the throne, I mean, you, you know the sort of the, the Saudi geopolitical posture. They were, they were very much against the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were responsible for financing and supporting the, the, the Sisi coup. Um, King Salman has taken a more conciliatory approach toward uh, political Islam and Islamism. Um, the Muslim Brotherhood is no longer persona non grata uh, to, in Riyadh as a result of his you know, reign. And the Saudis have now begun to um, funnel weapons and materiel to groups that are part of a consortium of militias, particularly in northern, northwestern Syria, known as the Army of Conquest, which includes Al Qaeda. And you know, the, the the window of opportunity for the U.S. to sort of rein in the Saudi support for the insurgency, or at least groups, you know, direct that support to groups that we would have, you know, preferred to work with. That window has now closed. With respect to Jordan, yeah, I mean, um, Muz al Qasasba came from a, a prominent tribe. His family is, is very influential. And when he was killed, his father and his relatives marched in the streets and they were, they were risking 
you know, charges of treason, no light matter in, in the Hashemite monarchy for denouncing the government and saying you didn't do enough to get him back and, and all of this. Um, there's another aspect, though, to Jordan's policy, which is they are one of the largest recipients of Syrian refugees. And uh, the camp, the Zatari camp that they're running, is quite squalid. You've mm -hmm. got uh, prostitution, radicalization galore happening in the, you know, refugee camps are next to prisons in the Middle East, academies or universities for minting jihadi fighters. It's, mm. it's always been the case. It always will be. Um, another component is the, Jordan has tried to keep the jihadism in Syria from pouring into its own borders by the inauguration of a buffer zone in southern Syria, in Deda province in particular. And to some extent they've been helped by, with the, by the Israelis and also by the U.S. And the main group that they have supported is called the Southern Front, which is an umbrella of about 54 different Free Syrian Army militias. Um, again, most of them nationalist. In Syria, geography matters a lot in terms of the ideological orientation. The North tends to be more conservative Muslim, and therefore it bleeds into Islamism and Salafism. Southern Syria tends to be a little more cosmopolitan and more, quote-unquote, secular or moderate, let us say. So the Southern Front was seen as a nice bulwark to keep the civil war kind of at bay. Um, the problem is, every time the Southern Front accomplished too much against the Assad regime, the spigot of weaponry, mostly ammunition, I should say, was turned off. And it was turned off because the CIA and the White House said, we don't want them to go and sack Assad state institutions. Well, now there's a new component, which is Russia's bombardment campaign in southern Syria, hmm. which is targeting the southern front, has actually created a, a, a sort of vector for ISIS. There's two groups in southern Syria. One's called the Yarmouk Martyrs Brigade. The other is the Muthana Movement, which are essentially cutouts for ISIS. Collectively, there are about 2,500 guys, but they're making inroads into southern Syria on the back of Russian airstrikes against their nemesis, the Free Syrian Army. Even the Israelis, the, the, the Financial Times quoted a, an IDF commander last week saying Russia's intervention is, is giving ISIS a new perch in southern Syria, a place where they really had had no presence before. Um, so th this is what complicates it with these, these Arab governments. Um, the fear of, of an internal rebellion of their own uh, constituents and their own citizens essentially aligning with terroristic enemies. I mean, again, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was what nationality? He was Jordanian. Mm. The first target of his in Iraq, in fact, in 2003, was the Jordanian embassy in Baghdad. Mm -hmm. The second target was the United Nations. Um, and this is one of the, one of the things that ISIS has, has preyed upon in their exploitation of the Qasasba capture, um, you know, returning to first principles, if you like declaring war again against the, the near enemy, which is Jordan and other regimes. Saudi Arabia, look, uh, if you look at the ISIS iconography, uh, their black flag with the Shahada, it envelops the globe, but they also put out posters and images showing um, you know, them in control of, of the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. you know, they, they, they have sacked Mecca and Medina. So they, they want to declare war against Saudi Arabia, and to some extent they have done. And this is also uh, motivating the Saudis to take you know, a, a very, very backseat role in this coalition. Right, but wh why is it so backseat? Well, they, their primary enemy is, is the primary enemy of, of most of the Sunnis in, in the region, which is Assad and Iran. Yeah. And yeah. they consider them greater foes than Iran. By the way, Sam, I mean, the Israelis too. You know, the Israeli posture in, in, with respect to Syria is, is one of the most intelligible on the planet. So the Israelis... You know, as Moshe Dayan said, there is no foreign policy, there's only national security policy. So for them, Jabhat al-Nusra, yeah, we can, you know, we, they don't dare come into the Golan, they don't dare provoke or antagonize us. Any Syrian military installation that shells or bombs in Israeli-occupied territory, the IDF powders them. And then they upload the video to their social media channels to show Assad that, that you know, don't even think about it. ISIS, though, I mean, if, if ISIS were to penetrate, that would be a major strategic uh, security threat for the Israelis. But really, their, their primary fear is the, the Revolutionary Guard of Iran and Hezbollah yeah. and the weapons transfers that are being, to this day, continued. Um, you know, the, the Russians play this game. It's, it's, it's actually very clever. You know, I mean, as much as Putin wants to prop up his client, the civil war has been good for business. Russian weapons exports are increasing by orders of magnitude. And one of the reasons is, look, the weapons the Syrian rebels use are what? Soviet or Russian made. 
You know, AK-47s, if they have tanks, they're usually the T-72s confiscated from the regime. Every time the, the rebels use their weapons to blow up Russian-made Syrian, uh, you know, material, it means that there's more weapons contracts, so Russia has, gets to sell more of its gear to not just Syria, but to Iran, which is giving it to Syria, and then on to Hezbollah. So the civil war has created this kind of rather cynical industry of, of, of you know, moving missiles and guns and tanks, armored vehicles, all throughout the region. It, it, mm. It's good for Putin in that sense. Again, we, we, we take this very binaristic approach to understanding these conflicts, but the rest of the world does not. You know, the West, the West behaves in a, in a much more straightforward manner um, than, than a lot of these other countries do. Uh, and, and this is part of the problem. And, you know, we, we, we can try... To, to impose our way of thinking on our allies and allies that act more like frenemies, to be honest. It doesn't work, though. You know, and you ask any American intelligence official or military official about you know, keeping together a coalition when you have all of these manifold actors on the ground and you have all of these, as I say, the kind of sideshow, the proliferation of sideshows, where they even, all of them eclipse eventually the main event. I'm now mindful of your time I'm wondering if I can get a, a few capsule answers to a few questions. So in light of everything you've just said, how do you view the nuclear arms agreement with Iran? And how do you view the current refugee crisis in Europe? So the nuclear arms deal with Iran, as an arms control agreement, I don't have a problem with it. But it's not an arms control agreement. It's a vehicle for rapprochement. And again, I mean, I can point you in any direction from administration officials up to the president who have made noises about bringing Iran in from the cold and, and having this as a kind of curtain raiser on a new era of cooperation. Um, you know, for instance, the, the, the taking of the U.S. naval um, sailors uh, last month or two months ago, the swift release of them was credited to the Iran deal, um, much like the, the hushing up of the three American contractors in Iraq being kidnapped has, has, has not been credited to the Iran deal. So, you know, fine, resolve the nuclear program diplomatically. I never advocated a military solution. I never wanted to bomb Iran. But again, do not then acquiesce to the hegemony of the, the IRGC throughout the region, particularly when all of your allies, as fraught, complicated, and uh, unreliable as they may be, they're still your allies. It's driving them nuts. And mm. it's, it's, creating, it's, it's creating this sort of metastasizing conflict of Sunni extremism. Um, as I mentioned, I mean, again, it comes back to the social and political drivers behind ISIS. Um, and it also feeds into that conspiracy, which is the U.S., Iran, and Russia contra mundum, basically. You know, every, they're, 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 versus, they're against all Sunni Arabs in the region. Um, so, you know, if it were just an arms control agreement, fine. And people compare it to, you know, what Reagan did with the Soviets. Yeah, but like Reagan never gave $150 billion to the KGB. Mm. You know, <laughs> this, is the, this is what's at issue here. So you have to have a strategic policy. And for, for 25, 30 years, it was containment. Now it's not no longer containment. And we're pursuing that about face in, the, in policy at the same time we're trying to contain a new threat, which is interlinked. And the threat is, is Sunni extremism, which is, as I say, thriving on the back of what is perceived to be a creeping Shia takeover of the region. Mm -hmm. So on to Europe. Yeah. Um, the refugee crisis is not going to stop. Um, it is being exacerbated. You had 100,000 trying to cross into to Turkey last week on the back of punishing Russian airstrikes. I think they did 400 strikes within a 15 kilometer zone within the space of 24 hours. So this is Grozny imported to the Levant. Mm. Uh, and, you know, in terms of the crisis and how it's affecting Europe, well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you, I'm sure you followed the case of the, the Russian German girl, who, the 13 year old who allegedly had been raped by a North African or Arab migrant in Berlin. The whole story was a complete fabrication promulgated by Russian state media designed really to undermine Angela Merkel because mm. of her support for sanctions uh, against Russia because of the Ukraine conflict. The refugee crisis is great for Putin because it, it, he knows that it's going to lead to the rise of far-right, Pujadist, populist demagogic elements um, from the Front National in France to Jabbik in Hungary, um, you know, and also, frankly, far left elements, which he, he has no problem partnering with either, uh, be it Podemos in Spain or Syriza in, in Greece. Um, 
who are frankly going to say we don't want we don't want sort of the the, the Muslim hordes descending upon our continent. Um, even traditional NATO allies, I mean, you know, Hungary, Viktor Orban has come out and said Hungary is a Christian state. We don't want to be taking in any Muslims. Yeah, um, even Sweden. Is, Sweden, is now, sure. Yeah. And look, there is a there is a legitimate. I mean, let's let's not be so kind of dewy eyed and, and and romantic here. There is oh, a, a well, security I, I'm threat. I'm not. I'm not. No, I know. I mean, I, there there I'm is a security threat. About this. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the Germans. It depends on which which. Um, which intelligence agency you talk to, the domestic or the foreign. But the Germans, they, they are concerned. I mean, you know, you, you have ISIS guys who are not themselves refugees, but who are going to masquerade as refugees coming into Europe. We saw this in the Paris attacks. This is how a lot of, you know, I think um, at least three of the, the, the ten operatives uh, got in via Greece on these fake Syrian passports posing as refugees. Um, so this is, a, this is a national security threat. Also, it plays into the ISIS narrative beautifully. When, um, when Le Front National, um, they didn't end up winning the election, but they won the, at least a large chunk of the first round of the regional elections in France not long after the, the Paris attacks. When that happened, ISIS on social media was, was cheering because they said, you see, we told you, like, it's either us or, you know, nobody because the West will, is, is anti-Islam. They're against all Sunni Islam. And, they're, you know, th th these, these parties fascist parties in, in Europe who want to close the borders and, and block all immigration, um, that's, the, that's exactly the kind of enemy we want to see because they, they, they make it simple. They don't dress it up in euphemism or in sort of moral posturing. They just say, no Muslims. Uh, and that, that will drive people into the arms of ISIS and similar-minded organizations. Interesting times, Michael. Well, Sam, look, you know, I say I, I, I kind of am out of I'm out of prescriptions. Like five years ago, I had them galore, and it's been it's been very humbling to watch, sort of you know to, to have a, a field of interest and and you know do a do this kind of work in a re part of the world that frankly I didn't know much about, you know half a decade ago, and just watch it burn to the ground, and people I know and have gotten to know well and care about either killed or driven from their country and now completely demoralized. And I just, I don't have any answers anymore. You know, I mean, you asked me, like, what are my solutions? Again, it's all like, it's, it's very theoretical, isn't it? Because I know that the U.S. is not going to do what's necessary. Or, it, it, you know, it, it will resort to half measures at best mm -hmm. and not the follow through. And the, and the lack of follow through um, is often worse than not having done anything at all. Yeah. For better or worse, the story's not going away. And so we will have other things to meditate on and talk about despite what we may want to pay attention to, it's going to just keep coming back to this, I think, again and again. And the way this is interacting with more traditional geopolitical concerns, I mean, Russia now is, you know, hitting the front page of the New York Times in a way that it hasn't in over a decade. And so the fact that shades of the Cold War are coming back to us because of the issue of jihadism and Islamism, I mean, it's just it, not not to depress our our listeners even more. But let me just ask the scariest of all questions: What are the chances in your mind that we are going to look back on these years and see this as the beginning, in some basic sense, of World War Three? Look, I mean, I, I lived in I lived in London for three years, so I've kind of I've, I've immersed myself in Europe, um, and I I can certainly see the lineaments of. <laughs> you know, the, the, the rise of very extremist ideology, not having anything to do with Islam or jihadism, by the way. Uh, and I see the recrudescence of them now. And, you know, look, I, I disagree with you slightly in the sense that I don't think that, you know, Cold War 2.0 is a direct result of what's happening in the Middle East. I think that's an epiphenomenon, if anything. Mm. I mean, the invasion of Ukraine had nothing to do with Muslims, for instance. But just the fact that it's creating a plausible scenario where we could wind up shooting at or being shot at by Russians directly. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's possible. I mean, um, you know, when Putin says, I can nuke Poland, or I can invade five NATO capitals within the space of two weeks. That's the kind of thing we would have taken very, very seriously 25, 30 years ago. Uh, and I think we're beginning to take it seriously again. Um, you know, Europe is once more becoming this kind of battleground. Uh, and at the borders, the, the, the sort of post-war order, the post-Cold War order has is, is collapsed. I mean, uh, could I see in my lifetime a nuclear exchange, whether it's tactical nukes or, you know, in intercontinental ballistic. Sure. I mean, you know, the, the idea that history comes to an end or that we, 
you know, in, in, the, in the 1980s were ushering in this kind of great riptide of liberal democracy. This is fantasy, man. I mean, this is, this is really kind of dangerous utopian ground. Um, you know, history grinds on. You know, the Middle East is going to have innumerable problems if and when ISIS is routed. I've already given you, as I say, you know, this, this kind of brief sketch of what I think is going to arise on, on the ashes of ISIS or the caliphate, and that's going to lead to all kinds of other um, new catastrophes. So, mm. yeah, it's, it's not fun doing this stuff, I'll be honest with you. Um, I'd rather be talking about, you know, Powerball or, or the Grammys, to be honest, some days of the week. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, interesting times, as the Chinese say, right? Yeah. May you live in them, and they don't mean it as a compliment. Well, you're proving to be a quite an expert guide to the apocalypse. So thank <laughs> that's going to be on the business card. So yeah. thank you for that. So thank you for your time and to be continued, Michael. Okay. Good talking yeah. to you. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast. Or you can support it directly. And there are two ways you can do this. You can leave a donation through my website at samharris.org forward slash donate. Or you can try a membership at Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks, at audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris.